The Bible tells us that God created everything, but hold on a second, there are some major omissions. Where are the dinosaurs? What about creatures like unicorns or other mythical beasts that ancient civilizations swear were real? If the Bible is the ultimate word of truth, why doesn't it account for every creature? Were these animals deliberately left out, and if so, why? Let's talk dinosaurs first. Fossil evidence is indisputable, a massive creatures roamed the earth millions of years before humans ever appeared. But the Bible, specifically Genesis, doesn't mention a single word about them. Not even a hint. How do you reconcile that? Some people try to squeeze them into the days of creation, claiming they must have been made on day 5 or 6. But isn't that just a workaround? A convenient patch job for a much bigger problem? We have overwhelming proof that dinosaurs existed, but their omission from scripture feels intentional, almost as if they disrupt the perfect timeline the Bible wants to preserve. And then there's the curious case of mythical animals, creatures like unicorns or the phoenix. Civilizations across history have documented sightings and interactions with these beasts, from ancient Greece to medieval Europe. Yet the Bible, which claims to be the definitive account of creation, stays silent. Some argue that these creatures were figments of imagination, but can we really dismiss the fact that they appear in multiple cultures, over millennia, all with shockingly similar descriptions? So, why are these creatures, both real and mythical, excluded? Is it possible that some animals were intentionally omitted because they don't fit the narrative? The biblical creation story is about order, structure, and a very specific kind of divine control. But dinosaurs? A fire-breathing phoenix? They represent chaos, untamed forces that don't submit to this neatly packaged creation story. Now, here's where it gets even more interesting. Some scholars suggest these omissions aren't accidental, they argue that the creatures not mentioned in the Bible might have origins that conflict with the idea of one all-powerful creator. What if these animals came from another source? An ancient deity, perhaps, or a force outside of Yahweh's creation? In fact, the Book of Enoch, a text that was excluded from the Bible, speaks of fallen angels, beings who descended from heaven and messed with creation. Could they have created creatures that were too controversial or too difficult to explain away? we might be looking at a deeper, hidden truth. One that's been filtered out for centuries. It's possible that these beings, dinosaurs, mythical creatures, were too difficult to incorporate into a divine story of perfect creation. After all, if you accept that some creatures existed outside of God's creation, then you have to ask, what else is missing? What other truths are we not being told? The Bible's exclusion of certain animals feels less like a coincidence and more like a deliberate act of omission. It's like curating history, leaving out the parts that don't fit the narrative. It forces us to ask tough questions, did God create all creatures, or were there others at play? And why is the biblical account so selective about the animals it chooses to acknowledge? We're all familiar with the Genesis creation story. God speaks, and life appears. But that's just one version of the story. What if I told you that other ancient cultures, equally powerful, equally influential, believed it wasn't just one God creating animals, but an entire pantheon of beings who shaped life as we know it? This isn't some fringe theory either. It's recorded history, embedded in the mythologies of ancient civilizations like Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Greece. Take the Sumerians, for example, the oldest known civilization, predating the Bible by thousands of years. They believed that gods like Enki and Ninhursag were responsible for creating not just humans but also the animals that filled the earth. Ninhursag, often referred to as the mother of all, was said to have mold creatures from clay, breathing life into them. This sounds eerily familiar, doesn't it? But in the Sumerian version, creation isn't limited to one omnipotent god, it's a collaborative process involving multiple deities, each with their own creative roles. And the Egyptians? They went even further. Their gods didn't just create animals, they were animals. Gods like Anubis, with the head of a jackal, or Horus, the falcon-headed god, blur the lines between divine beings and earthly creatures. In their worldview, Animals weren't lesser beings created to serve humans, they were extensions of the divine itself. 
What does that do to the idea that animals were just another part of God's creation, intended to serve humanity? In Greek mythology, we see a similar pattern. The goddess Artemis was the protector of animals, while Poseidon, god of the sea, was believed to have created horses from sea foam. Each god had domain over specific animals, implying that the natural world was the result of divine specialization, not the product of a single creator. Here's where things get uncomfortable. What if these gods weren't just myth? What if they were real supernatural entities that had the power to create? The Bible itself acknowledges the existence of other gods in certain passages, but it always frames them as inferior or false. Yet these other ancient cultures believed their gods were just as real, just as powerful, and just as capable of creation as the God of Israel. If other cultures had their own gods who created animals, why does the Bible erase that possibility? Was it a theological power move, a way to consolidate all creative authority into one god, erasing any trace of competition? Or, even more provocatively, is it possible that the Bible's creation story is just one version of a much larger, more complex narrative, one where multiple beings, both divine and supernatural, played a role in shaping the natural world? The Bible presents us with a singular, orderly creation story. But these are the myths. They're chaotic. They're messy. And they suggest that creation wasn't a neat, one-time event, but an ongoing, multifaceted process involving gods that might have had their own agendas. Animals, in these stories, aren't afterthoughts or servants, they're deliberate, purposeful creations, sometimes even sacred beings. What's really fascinating is how these stories challenge the very core of monotheism. If you start accepting that other gods were involved in creation, it upends the entire structure of biblical authority. It makes you question, did Yahweh really create all animals, or were some of them the product of rival gods, forgotten or erased over time? There's something strange lurking in the pages of the Bible, creatures so massive, so terrifying, they hardly seem to fit within the framework of God's peaceful, orderly creation. I'm talking about the Leviathan and Behemoth. They aren't your typical biblical animals. These aren't docile creatures grazing in a field. They're chaotic, wild, and untamable. And they raise some serious questions about the origin of life and who, or what, was involved in creating it. The Leviathan is described in Job 41 as a sea monster, a creature with multiple heads, breathing fire and smoke. It's not just big, it's beyond comprehension, something that can't be subdued by humans. In fact, God himself speaks of the Leviathan as an example of his power, but its very existence seems like a contradiction. Why would a creature of such destructive force exist in a world created by a benevolent God who seeks order? How does this monster fit into the carefully structured creation story of Genesis? Then there's the Behemoth, also mentioned in the Book of Job. It's portrayed as a gigantic, land-dwelling creature, a beast so powerful it drinks up entire rivers and stands unmoved by human efforts. Some have tried to rationalize the behemoth as an elephant or a hippopotamus, but the biblical description doesn't line up with any modern-day animal we know of. It seems to be something else entirely, something ancient, primeval, and beyond our understanding. Here's where it gets interesting. These creatures don't just exist, they represent the forces of chaos that early civilizations believed were constantly at odds with the divine order. The Leviathan, for example, has clear parallels in other ancient myths. In Canaanite mythology, Baal, the storm god, battles Yam, the god of the chaotic sea, and his sea monsters, including one strikingly similar to the Leviathan. Other cultures, like the Babylonians, tell stories of gods fighting sea serpents that represent chaos and destruction. Could it be that the Leviathan and the Hemoth are remnants of these ancient, pre-biblical stories? Stories where creation wasn't a peaceful act of God speaking life into existence, but a violent struggle between forces of order and chaos. And if these creatures are part of that older, more chaotic worldview, it raises another question, did God create them, or did they predate God's orderly creation in Genesis? The Bible, especially in the Old Testament, often reflects a world in which chaos was never fully subdued. The Leviathan and Behemoth are lingering reminders of that chaos, monsters that can't be tamed, creatures that continue to challenge the notion that God's creation was ever fully under control. 
In fact, the book of Job never says God created the Leviathan or Behemoth. It merely describes them as existing, almost as if they've always been there. This could suggest that they are holdovers from an earlier time, maybe even predating God's creation of the world as we know it. If that's the case, then the story we've been told, that God created everything in perfect harmony, starts to look incomplete, even misleading. But here's the kicker, the Bible doesn't present God as destroying these creatures, just acknowledging their existence. It's almost as if God respects their power, letting them serve as reminders that not everything is neat and controlled, that chaos still lurks in the shadows of creation. These creatures don't just challenge the idea of a peaceful, orderly creation, they undermine it entirely. If the Leviathan and Behemoth represent the untamable, chaotic forces that still exist in the world, it means creation isn't finished. It's still an ongoing battle between order and chaos, with creatures like these serving as a reminder that the world is far more mysterious and far less under control than we've been led to believe. The story of the serpent in the Garden of Eden is one of the most iconic in the Bible. We all know it, Eve is tempted by a cunning snake, she eats the forbidden fruit, and humanity is plunged into sin. But here's the question that no one seems to ask, was that serpent actually created by God? And if not, where did it come from? Let's break this down. The Bible is pretty clear in Genesis that God creates everything, the heavens, the earth, the animals, humans. But there's a sudden shift when the serpent appears in Genesis 3. The serpent is described as being more crafty than any other animal the Lord God had made, but its role is far too specific, far too sinister, to be just another one of God's creations. It doesn't just slither onto the scene as a passive observer, it has knowledge, intelligence, and an agenda. The question is, why would God create a creature whose sole purpose seems to be the downfall of humanity? Does that make any sense? If you believe in a benevolent, omnipotent creator, why would he make a creature like the serpent at all, knowing full well what would happen? This inconsistency is where things start to get interesting. Some scholars and theologians suggest that the serpent wasn't part of God's original creation. In fact, it might not have been created by God at all. There's a growing theory that the serpent is more than just an animal, it's a representative of a darker, more rebellious force. Whether that's Satan, a fallen angel, or some other malevolent entity, the serpent's presence in Eden represents chaos and rebellion creeping into what was supposed to be a perfect world. If you look outside the biblical canon, you'll find even more clues. In many ancient cultures, the serpent is a symbol of wisdom, transformation, and danger. In Gnosticism, the serpent is actually seen as a liberator, offering knowledge to humanity in defiance of a tyrannical god. This isn't the story we're told in Sunday school, but it's a perspective worth considering. The serpent's role might not have been to destroy humanity, but to reveal something to us, something that was intentionally kept hidden. Now, let's add another layer. In many ancient myths, serpents are linked to gods of the underworld, representing the forces that stand in opposition to order and divine rule. In Mesopotamian myth, the god Enki, often depicted with serpents, was associated with wisdom and trickery. In Egyptian mythology, Apep, the great serpent of chaos, was constantly trying to overthrow the sun god Ra. These serpents weren't just part of the natural world, they were agents of chaos, trying to dismantle divine order. Could the serpent in Eden be part of this tradition? If that's true, then the serpent's appearance in Eden was no accident. It wasn't a part of God's creation, it was an invader. A being from outside God's perfect world, whose very presence disrupted the divine plan. The serpent in Eden could represent a force that predates, or at least rivals, God's creation, a symbol of rebellion and chaos that God couldn't fully control. The Bible never says the serpent was destroyed. It was punished, sure, made to crawl on its belly for all time, but it wasn't erased from existence. The serpent, or at least what it represents, remains a part of our world, still sowing chaos, still challenging the idea that creation is a finished, perfect work. Now, if you think the Bible paints a complete picture of creation, it's about to get a whole lot more complicated. There's a story hidden in ancient texts that's been left out of most modern Bibles, the story of the Watchers. These weren't just any angels, they were a group of divine beings that descended to earth and did something unthinkable, 
they broke divine law and intermingled with humans. But here's the part that gets even more disturbing, they didn't just alter humanity. According to the Book of Enoch, these fallen angels corrupted the natural world too, including the animals. So what exactly happened here? The Watchers, after rebelling against God's order, began tampering with the creatures of the earth. The Book of Enoch describes how these angels taught humans forbidden knowledge, metallurgy, weaponry, sorcery, but it also hints at a much darker truth. They began manipulating animals, creating strange and unnatural hybrids that were never part of God's plan. This wasn't just about teaching humans, this was about reshaping the very fabric of creation, bending it into something chaotic, something that reflected their rebellion. The idea that not all animals were part of God's original creation opens a door to an entirely different understanding of the world around us. What if some of the creatures that roamed the ancient world, or even today, aren't part of God's blueprint? What if they were the result of the Watcher's forbidden experiments, hybrid creatures that were never meant to exist in the first place? In the Book of Enoch, it's hinted that these unnatural beings, the offspring of the Watcher's interference, were so grotesque, so dangerous, that God had to intervene and destroy them with the Great Flood. And yet, even after the Flood, remnants of these corrupted beings may have survived. If the Watchers had the power to manipulate animals, who's to say that their influence didn't persist? Are there creatures in our world today, perhaps ones that don't seem to fit within the natural order, that trace their origins back to this ancient interference? This story flips the entire narrative of creation on its head. It introduces the idea that the natural world isn't entirely natural. Instead, it suggests that some animals, those not mentioned in the Bible, might be the product of a dark, rebellious force that tried to reshape creation for its own purposes. And if that's true, then we're living in a world where the line between divine creation and corruption is a lot blurrier than we've been led to believe. It's no wonder this story was left out of the official biblical canon. The Watchers represent a direct challenge to the idea of a perfectly ordered, divinely controlled creation. They represent chaos, rebellion, and a perversion of the natural world. But the question remains, how much of their influence lingers? Are there creatures we see today that were never part of God's original design? We've been taught that animals are part of God's creation, designed as companions and resources for humanity. But what if some animals didn't come from God at all? What if ancient beings, the Anunnaki, were responsible for genetically engineering creatures that walked the earth, perhaps even long before humans ever arrived? The Anunnaki are deities from ancient Mesopotamian mythology, and according to Sumerian texts, they were powerful beings that descended from the heavens. In these ancient stories, the Anunnaki weren't just passive gods, they were active manipulators of life. Some interpretations suggest that the Anunnaki didn't just influence humanity, but tampered with the natural world, including the animals. In Sumerian mythology, the Anunnaki were said to have played a crucial role in shaping life on Earth. Some fringe theories even go so far as to suggest that these gods were responsible for advanced forms of genetic manipulation. Think about that for a second, ancient deities playing with the genetic code, creating life forms not as part of some divine plan, but as a series of experiments. It sounds like science fiction, but if you dig into the myths, it's not that far-fetched. Take the Epic of Gilgamesh, for example. This ancient text talks about hybrid beings, part human and part animal creatures, roaming the earth. These weren't the products of natural evolution. Could these hybrids have been the result of the Anunnaki's genetic experiments? Some researchers think so, pointing to depictions of Chimras, creatures that are a mix of different species, such as the Sumerian Lamassu, a being with the body of a bull, the wings of a bird, and the face of a human, as evidence of unnatural genetic blending. What's even more provocative is the suggestion that the Anunnaki weren't alone in this. Other ancient cultures, like the Egyptians, the Greeks, even the Hindus, all tell stories of gods who created animal hybrids or strange, supernatural creatures. These myths could all be pointing to the same thing, that gods, or powerful supernatural beings, were experimenting with life on Earth, bending the rules of nature, mixing species, and creating entirely new forms of animals. Now, let's talk about the implications of this. 
If these ancient gods were indeed involved in genetic manipulation, it means that not all animals originated from divine creation in the biblical sense. Some could have been artificially created or altered by the Anunnaki for their own purposes, whether as experiments, tools, or even as beings to serve them. This completely challenges the idea that God created every living thing in a perfect, orderly fashion. Instead, it suggests a world where life was altered and manipulated by forces outside of God's control. What if some of the animals we see today, or those we know existed in ancient times, are descendants of these genetic experiments? Think about the mythical creatures that seem to pop up across cultures, dragons, griffins, sphinxes. Some could dismiss these as pure fantasy, but what if they were based on something real? What if these beings were the remnants of the Anunnaki's genetic meddling, leaving traces of their presence in the myths and stories passed down over thousands of years? If that's the case, then the natural world isn't as unnatural as we've been led to believe. It's a complex, manipulated system where divine creation and genetic engineering intersect. The Anunnaki could have played a key role in shaping the animal kingdom, possibly even creating creatures that weren't meant to exist according to the laws of nature as we understand them. And if they did, what else is lurking in our history that challenges the biblical story of creation? We've heard the story of the Nephilim, the offspring of fallen angels and human women. Giants that once roamed the earth, beings that existed outside the natural order. But what if their influence didn't stop with humans? What if these beings, these rebellious hybrids, also tampered with the animal kingdom, creating creatures that were never meant to exist? Ancient texts, especially those outside the biblical canon, hint at something far more unsettling. In the Book of Jubilees and other non-canonical works, there are references to the Nephilim corrupting the animals of the earth. But what does that mean, exactly? It suggests that these beings, already outside the bounds of divine order, went further and began creating unnatural hybrids, part human, part animal, and possibly even part divine. Creatures that blurred the lines between man, beast, and God. Think about the stories from ancient cultures that speak of these hybrid beings. The centaurs of Greek mythology, half-man, half-horse. The minotaur, locked in the labyrinth, a creature with the body of a man and the head of a bull. Even the Sphinx in Egypt, a lion with a human face, guarding the mysteries of the pyramids. Are these just myths, or are they echoes of a time when beings like the Nephilim created unnatural creatures, hybridizing man and animal in ways that were never intended? If the Nephilim were capable of corrupting animals, it would explain the many strange and terrifying creatures that pop up in ancient stories. Beings that didn't fit the mold of God's creation, creatures that were powerful, intelligent, and monstrous. It opens the door to the possibility that the animal kingdom wasn't just tampered with by rebellious angels, but fundamentally changed. These hybrids could be remnants of a darker era, an era where creation was not under the sole control of the divine, but influenced by rebellious forces. Many ancient civilizations didn't just tell stories about these hybrids, they worshipped them. The gods and creatures they revered often had animal forms or hybrid features, half-man, half-animal beings that were seen as divine. Were these civilizations unknowingly paying tribute to the creations of the Nephilim, beings that were never part of the divine plan? The Nephilim were said to have been wiped out by the Great Flood, but their legacy seems to have lived on. If their influence reached into the animal kingdom, it's possible that some of these creatures survived, perhaps not in their original form, but in the myths and legends passed down through generations. The hybrids of ancient law may have been real, living beings at one point, corrupted creatures that the biblical narrative tries to erase or downplay. This forces us to reconsider everything we've been told about creation. The animals we see in the Bible are presented as pure, part of a perfect world created by God. But the existence of hybrid creatures suggests that not everything in the animal kingdom was as it seemed. Some creatures may have been the product of dark, rebellious forces, beings that tampered with creation in ways that we can barely understand. And now, after everything we've discussed in this video, it's clear that the creation story we've been told is far from complete. From animals potentially being left out of the Bible, to ancient gods and angels tampering with creation, it's a far more complex, chaotic narrative than we ever realized. The animals we see today might not all have come from a single divine source. 
Their origins could be a mix of divine creation, supernatural manipulation, and even rebellion. Thank you for watching this deep dive into the untold stories of creation. If you found this content thought-provoking, make sure to like, leave a comment with your thoughts, and hit subscribe to stay updated on future videos. Your engagement means the world, and it keeps this conversation going. God bless you all, and until next time.